2020 marks 50 years since Nigeria had its civil war. And speaking on the matter, Professor Walesho Inka and Professor Banji Akintoye have lamented that Nigeria is yet to learn any lessons from the civil war. Akintoye further said the current mood in Nigeria is similar to the mood of the country months before the civil war began in 1967. Can we say this is true or not? Has Nigeria learned its lessons? Still with me in the studio are Francis Chilaka. Thank you very much for Thank staying you. with us. And of course, we have um, Dikbo Olayokun. Thank you very much for Still staying uh, with us. When you think, before we get to the questions uh, posed by these um, notable Nigerians, when you think about Nigeria since the Civil War, what comes to your mind? A cracked pot. I've always visioned Nigeria as a cracked pot. That cracked that it's not able to hold its contents together. How about you? Yes, it's, a, it's a something that we find very disheartening. That uh, we didn't seem to learn any lesson. Unfortunately, and unfortunately, our leaders, I mean, in all spheres of life, don't seem to understand the implication of some of their utterances at times. They don't talk like elders. I don't mean to disrespect anybody. But going by, I, I was watching the television station in the morning, and uh, this uh, great man, Mr. Sam Ohabunwa, was on air. In fact, it was this money I got to know for the first time that he took, he took part in the war. Because he said if he had removed that his fine jacket, that Nigeria would see, Nigerians would see the scars of war. And when you look at, yeah, you read some of these things in the book. Some of us were very small, that time the war was going on, and we saw and we had some things. But I think if you look at our conduct, our utterances, we don't seem to have learned any lesson. This conversation is just getting started, but let's um, get the thought of a very notable Nigerian, Patrick Tommy. He joins us on the phone. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Pleasure. Uh, some of the issues, um, some of the things um, discussed at the conference you had was that the issues that gave rise to uh, the civil war still seems to be bedeviling us today. Didn't we learn anything? Well, um, human beings learn things all the time. The big question is the quality of the learning and what the information that has come is deployed to. Uh, the goal is to change how humans cooperate because when humans learn to cooperate better, the common good is elevated. Um, my experience is that since the war, we've not done enough to learn from it. In fact, we've done more to sweep the experience under the carpet. And in doing that, we have set ourselves up to possibly repeat those mistakes. One of the easiest examples is the quality of public conversation. If you lived in Nigeria in 66 and uh, 67, the newspapers, uh, the broadcast stations were a war zone, uh, just like social media is right now. And this led us down a sorry path. And so we need to change back. We need to have more rational public conversation uh, instead of uh, emotive raining of abuses on other people who we fear may not share in our point of view on any matter. The truth of the matter is that when different perspectives come together in a rational way, and we are dealing with the issues rather than insulting one another. It's easy to learn 
from the position of the other and perhaps arrive at the consensus point that advances the good of all, that leads to a win-win solution to whatever problem it is that uh, society is confronted with. Uh, Professor um, Akintoy, um, in that conference, uh, recalled the restructuring uh, conversation as uh, one of the ways that we can address uh, the challenges that we have. And he put a, a particular spin on it. Do you agree that that is an option for us? Well, I don't like to use the word restructuring because it has been deliberately given a bad name. You know, when you want to hang a dog, you give it a black, bad name. Words are very powerful tools. Once they pick up all kinds of connotations, they become unhelpful in public conversation. So today, when you say restructuring, you are raising in the minds of some people the whole idea of, ah, you want to get a bigger share of the national cake. Because that's the only way Nigerians have learned to think about governing, getting a share of the cake. Now, they don't understand that this share of the cake is getting them poorer and poorer and poorer by the day. The real progress is made by baking cakes. And that the way cakes are best baked is by applying the principle of subsidiarity. The principle of subsidiarity is when decision making is closer to the people. Because when you deal with a far away distant federal government in Abuja that controls everything and hands out prebends, uh, share of the cake to people, you will deal with a disconnected state that is not able to empower an entrepreneurial base where wealth is created, the way that wealth was created in the early 60s and late 50s. The kind of wealth creation that led Michael Okpara, Premier of Eastern Region, to boost in 1964, for example, that Eastern Nigeria, disconnected from Nigeria, was the fastest growing economy in the world. Uh, the way that led Chief Obafemi Awolowo to take out the first step in industrialization by creating what is today the Ikeja Industrial Estate, and was immediately imitated by Okpara, who created Transamadi Import Accord and Aba, and by the Sadarna of Sokoto, who created Kakuri in Kaduna, which became the hub of Nigeria's textile industry, because that was an endowment of, of uh, the North at the time. So um, if you use the word restructuring, you create all kinds of emotions. But the simple truth is that there is too much of a concentration at the center, and we need to move away from that if we are going to create wealth and get our people out of poverty. Well, in fact, let you go. OK. So I was going to say that, in fact, if one of the things that we learn is the fact that sharing the booty <laughs> makes people poorer, let us use the example that I like to turn to local governments. In the 1960s, there were many more local governments in the South than in the North, because it was just an administrative thing of convenience. You created as many as you felt comfortable with. Uh, local governments were not involved in fiscal transfers. That is the sharing of the distributable pool fund, uh, what we now refer to as the FAC account. Now, come 1975, 76, under the Obasanjo administration, uh, there were reforms that led to local government tire becoming part of the fiscal transfer system. And this meant that um, allocations now were going to local governments, fairly significant uh, levels of allocations going to local governments. As a result of this incentive, as it were, the more powerful people began to get more and more local governments for their areas. My joke used to be that every colonel in the army pushed to make his village a local government area. The result is that we've ended up with 774 local governments, and about 500 of those are in the north. 
that used to have fewer local governments before. They don't have more than twice as many as in the South. All right. This means that a significant portion of the wealth that has been earned or whatever uh, through oil has been flowing to the North through this mechanism of fiscal transfers to local governments. But guess what? The North has become much poorer than it used to be in those days. And uh, some of the southern states have become much, much more wealthy. So the lesson is that the share of the national cake you get doesn't make you richer. But our politicians don't understand this because it enables them as individual politicians to access public uh, resources for their own personal good. But their own people in general get worse off because they are getting more allocation. All uh, right, sir. Um, I, I will have to interrupt you and um, you know say thank you very much because so I can also get my guest in here to also share their thoughts. All right. Then. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. All right, you, you heard him. Uh, I wouldn't want us to rehash some of the points he has made, but I, I want to ask this question about commemorating the Nigerian Civil War. Uh, there was an event yesterday, uh, I think it was tagged Never Again Conference, and he was one of the keynote speakers at that event. We also had Wale Shoei and the likes of them. So the conversation about commemorating the Nigerian Civil War being equated with what we have now as our new democracy day, June 12. You know, some people say it is important that that day is also commemorated. On the flip side, there is the argument that uh, that will only enhance agitation for you know, self-secession and uh, all of that. I'll put that question to you. Yeah, 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 it is good to remember such days, like what happened yesterday, uh, because at times, there's a Yoruba proverb that when your eyes are bringing out a moko, you remove it and show the eyes <laughs> to tell you that something is wrong with you. I, I, what we need to do if we are going to have such assembly or, assemblage or gathering is to make sure that you have people like Professor Patitomi speak to Nigerians. But when you use the occasion to open wounds, of the past, which I think that's majorly what many of them did yesterday. But I listened to him, and he followed it up with a release either today I can't. But I was I just read it before I came out of the car to come into the studio. That Nigerians need to apply the brake software, especially the way we disseminate information. And the major culprit is the social media. Post any issue on any subject matter. After three or four comments, the thing will now become an aggression between two <coughs> opposing ethnic groups. Any matter. Even if it is just, we saw a dog, and I saw a dog. Look at the comment that will follow. And that is what is driving the narrative in our comments and commentaries. And unfortunately, our leaders or elders that are supposed to, to tell these children what happened in the war. The instead of saying we cannot go there, that's why I like the, the tag. He decided never again. Yeah. Because if you, I have a colleague in the office, very elderly man. Anytime this man wants to show us about yesterday, he will open his tie. You will see a very big scar. He said he was a camp boy during the war. So if you tell children some of these things, maybe some of these things we are seeing that is bringing about these ethnic they can issues. Make informed choice to know that we should never again. Okay, um, still from that conference, uh, Wale Shoinka warned, uh, he made a quote that I'd like to uh, pick. He says, no nation has ever survived two Just civil wars. Um, he said, <clears throat> that comment might not be uh, historically uh, sustainable. He argued that our capacity to be resilient is not um, an excuse and not a justification for tempting fate. Um, with our conduct today, he's saying, yes, we keep warning against war, but what are we doing to ensure that never again it happens? 
You know, when 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 I read through, I've I've gone through all the lectures, some of most of the lectures that were delivered, and one thing that keeps coming back to mind is the fact that our leaders are the culprits of the problem of going back to the war. Check, check for instance, check, check um, the appointments of Mr. President. Yeah, Professor Akinto referred to that yes, as well. Yes, it's one-sided. So some, you, you're doing something and you know that this were the things that caused a bigger problem. And you're still doing it with impunity. You're not interested in what anybody says. Why do you think people will sit down and begin to agitate for Biafra and all of that? It's because even though their parents try to educate them, like you said, showing the scar, but if you're showing the scar and there is nothing to follow up with, you're asking the person, the person you're showing the scar doesn't, is no longer interested. So I think it's, it's, it's something that, you see, for us to say never again, our leaders need to come to their senses to realize that it is not about what you say, but it's about what you do. Well, how can we, how can we, our leaders are still people, some of them, if not all of them, were alive during the Civil War. They knew the, you know, the um, circumstances that led to that war. They are still in power. What needs to give in order for them to truly learn the lessons as um, scholars are putting forward? Nobody gives up power willingly. Nobody. Exactly. I think, I don't think, yes, they might be conducting themselves in a manner that is driving us through the precipice. But if we, the so-called followers, know what we are doing, let me tell you one thing, my dear sister. At the level of that leadership, and I repeat, at the level of that leadership, our leaders don't talk about Yoruba Ibu Ausa. They don't. I don't know if you have been seeing this uh, video that uh, the big block of video that went viral in the past three, four days. At uh, the uh, Nuru Hivadu's daughter's or son's wedding. And you see our leaders putting aside their ethnic, their religious, their political differences. And that is the way they operate. But after operating, we are the unified level at that level. They come to us and begin to preach ethnicity. How can we change that quickly? That is why I say it is more of we. The people. The people. It that we should realize that they are only dividing us so that they will be able to maintain that, that system. We are the ones that should come together, not minding where you have come from, not minding your religion, not minding whatever, or the differences, to know that those guys at that level are very united. I guess that's why the history lessons no, are still very know, but, relevant but see, today. I, 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 sir, let me differ with you. As a father, and you tell your son, this man is my enemy. And your son expects that whenever he's doing anything, you will not go. And you now tell your son that you're going there in order to bring what he has stolen from him to give to you. This is what they're doing. So when they go there, the impression they're giving the followers is that I am going to get back what has been stolen for you. How many, for how many years have they given it to us? Yeah, but they have but we know what happens during elections. We know how the people are treated. One of the richest men in the Southeast, the man is Atoize. I was reading his interview about three or two weeks ago that the person that gave him what you will say is the breakthrough is somebody from the north. All right, I'm, I'm afraid we really have to end the conversation now. I wish we could go on. Thank you so much for your thoughts on the program. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, several weeks back, news. Okay, we'll go on a short break, and when we come back, I'll give you my take. You stay with us. The Kaduna state government has expressed commitment to tackling the insecurity challenges bedeviling the state. The state governor, Nasir Erbufai, made this known in Kaduna state when he received a delegation from the Fellowship of the Church of Christ in Nigeria. Governor Erbufai, who was represented by his deputy, Hadiza Balarabi, called on religious leaders in the state to complement the efforts of the government by continuing to pray for the peace and development of the state. 
in Kaduna. We've had so many challenges, uh, kidnapping, banditry, and robbery, and, and all. And most recently, there was an explosion that uh, took uh, life. We're doing our best, but I know that the interventions of prayers that God in his mercies will give us, you know, the grace and the wisdom to be able to do what is right uh, in the state. We should pray for our leaders so that there might be peace in the land. I call on the federal government and uh, the state to make sure that uh, justice is dispensed, that people are united, because we have very good brains in this country. We can use them. In the face of uh, you know, security challenges, for only with that can we see what God has deposited in us. The story of the Nigerian civil war and what led to it has been told and will continue to be told. But the telling does not seem to have amounted to much because the very issues that led to the fighting in the first instance remains even today. A conversation here tonight, as many others being held across the country, is important and needs to be regular to refresh our memories and to keep us on our toes so that we do not forget in a hurry the horrors of war and in time, hopefully, we will learn the very important lessons it taught us. The lessons remain very relevant today as we grapple with a myriad of seemingly endless challenges as a country. We're already a special breed of humanity. Greatness resides in the people of this country. And we can truly be great if only our leaders will be bold and reboot this country along honest, egalitarian lines. And that is my take tonight. And that's how we wrap the program up. Remember, we're always happy to hear from you. You can find us across social media platforms at PLOS TV Africa. Thank you for watching. Be safe and I will see you tomorrow.